Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for a uh, uh, nice introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I would like to start uh, with a famous quote by uh, uh, Mr. Isaac Watts, who was a famous uh, theologist. Uh, the eyes of a man in the jaundice make yellow observations on everything. And the soul tinctured with any passion diffuses a false color over the appearance of things. So, but I don't know how our babies with jaundice, uh, that, uh, they can see everything. Um, I will leave that up to the researchers. Uh, let's talk about uh, the neonatal jaundice, which is basically a very vast topic to cover in 45, 35, 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, so in this uh, presentation, I will uh, try to cover most of the parts related to unconjugated uh, neonatal jaundice. I will leave uh, conjugated uh, hyperbilirubinemia for maybe some other opportunity in the future. So in this lecture, I'm going to cover uh, some, with some introductory uh, remarks, uh, then categories of jaundice, uh, a clinical assessment of jaundice, consequences of neonatal jaundice, phototherapy, exchange transfusion, uh, 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 so a few points, slides on adjunct therapy in the neonatal jaundice, and also uh, uh, some uh, follow-up tips. And I would like to conclude my presentation with uh, some take home messages. Neonatal hyperbilirubinemia is attributable to a metabolic imbalance favoring bilirubin production over hepatic enteric bilirubin clearance. The condition affects 60 to 80% of newborn babies and is a leading cause of hospitalization in the first few days of life. In fact, if we are dealing with premature and extremely premature babies, the percentage can go maybe beyond 90 percent, sometimes 100 percent. In some babies, excessive bilirubin concentrations can place them at a risk of acute bilirubin encephalopathy and also chronic bilirubin encephalopathy if not appropriately monitored and treated. Usually, we tend to take jaundice cases a bit lightly. Uh, we think it's, it's one of the minor problems, but if we look at the global burden of the condition, it is not a minor problem at all, as uh, reported um, a paper in Lancet published in 2018. They, uh, they have shown the statistics that neonatal jaundice accounted for more than 1,300 uh, deaths per 100,000 live births, which is ranked globally seventh cause of neonatal deaths in the early neonatal period. And the burden of disease was highest in South Asian countries and in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it, uh, like it was found to be seventh and eighth leading cause of neonatal mortality respectively. And uh, the condition is uh, quite substantially present in, in the developed world as well, including North America and Western Europe. In the late neonatal period as well, the problem is um, not at all in, in, insignificant. We, uh, this is actually ranked ninth globally as it causes more than 180 deaths per 100,000 live births. So this is a very well-known uh, uh, metabolic pathway of uh, the bilirubin uh, metabolism. As we all know, him, him, uh, bilirubin comes from um, him, which is a breakdown product of RBC. And this uh, him uh, gives rise to uh, bilirubin, which ultimately produces uh, uh, bilirubin. And it is bound to albumin in the bloodstream, which is called unconjugated bilirubin. And that ultimately enters the liver through the ligandin or Y protein, where it conjugates with uh, uh, this uh, enzyme e uridine glucuronide transferase to, uh, to, uh, to produce conjugated bilirubin, which ultimately is excreted um, through the gut in the form of starcobilin and urobilin. And uh, a portion of this bilirubin enters into the circulation again through enterohepatic circulation. 
So what are the types of bilirubin? We commonly use these terminologies, direct, indirect, conjugated and unconjugated. Uh, so direct and conjugated bilirubin are usually used interchangeably, but there is minor difference because the direct bilirubin, by direct bilirubin, we actually mean the bilirubin which reacts with uh, diazosulfanilic acid um, to form azobilirubin, which actually includes conjugated bilirubin and delta bilirubin. So what is delta bilirubin? It is the bilirubin which is covalently bound with albumin, which appears in the circulation when hepatic excretion of conjugated bilirubin is impaired. So it's basically a type of conjugated bilirubin, which comes back from the liver into the circulation and bound, binds with albumin, whereas the pure conjugated bilirubin is no more albumin bound. It is basically uridine diphosphoglucuronide enzyme bound. And we all know unconjugated bilirubin and conjugated bilirubin. So why jaundice develops? If we say in a very simplified way, it is all about how the body is managing bilirubin, how the body is adjusting with the bilirubin load. If there is increased production of bilirubin, then there will be excessive amount of bilirubin in the circulation. Commonly, the hemolytic conditions, RH incompatibility, ABH incompatibility, and other immune conditions. It can be due to decreased conjugation, which may be due to decreased amount of the enzyme responsible for this uh, bilirubin conjugation in the liver. A uh, common cause, of course, prematurity, extreme prematurity, but there can be some other genetic conditions as well, like Krieglander syndrome, Gilbert syndrome. Impaired excretion of bilirubin, again, may give rise to significant clinical jaundice, which is actually uh, uh, the main pathophysiology of conjugated or obstructive jaundice. So clinical categories of hyperbilirubinemia, these are some interesting terminologies as suggested by, uh, by Dr. Bhutani, who is one of the pioneers in uh, 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 neonatal uh, jaundice. So uh, as uh, published in Journal of Perinatology, uh, they, they have categorized uh, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia in, into different subtypes like when we have to call it significant hyperbilirubinemia. Of course, it will depend on the postnatal age of the baby, clinical condition of the baby, birth weight of the baby. But in general, whenever TSB level, total serum bilirubin level is more than 12 milligram per uh, DL, uh, which possibly will require phototherapy uh, for many of the babies, this is called significant hyperbilirubinemia. When the bilirubin is reaching at or near exchange level, roughly 20 milligram per DL, or any elevated TSB associated with the early signs of acute bilirubin in mild bilirubin encephalopathy, that it is called severe hyperbilirubinemia. Then extreme hyperbilirubinemia, whenever it is reaching 25 milligram um, per DL or more, or the concentrations at which at which we have to consider exchange transmission anyways. And also this level of bilirubin possibly can cause mild to moderate acute bilirubin encephalopathy. When we, we have to call it hazardous, if the bilirubin is reaching 30 milligram per DL or more, or any elevated level where there is signs of moderate to severe acute bilirubin encephalopathy. So the, uh, like 12, then uh, 20, 25, 30. When we call acute bilirubin encephalopathy, if there is acute manifestations of bilirubin toxicity seen within 14 days of birth, and if there is permanent or chronic neurological damage, including choreoathetoid cerebral palsy, enamel dysplasia of teeth, paralysis of upward gaze and hearing impairments, then it is the ultimate damage to the brain, which is called chronic bilirubin encephalopathy or chronic terrace. So what are the risk factors of hyperbilirubinemia? Well, it is a very long list. I just picked up the important or major risk factors for hyperbilirubinemia. Pre-discharge TSB in high-risk zone 
in the bilirubin nomogram jaundice observed within first 24 hours to 48 hours of life abo incompatibility with positive combs test or other hemolytic conditions of course rh incompatibility as well gestational age less than 37 weeks previous sibling receiving phototherapy which is a very important factor actually for uh, the subsequent babies cephalohematoma or significant bruising sometimes we tend to ignore this condition but this is a very important cause of significant hyperbilirubinemia Ex exclusive breastfeeding especially if the mother is not nursing well for first few days of life and if the baby has excessive weight loss male gender polycythemia hypoglycemia and east asian race these are the uh, important major risk factors for hyperbilirubinemia how do we assess clinically so this is a famous uh, kramer's index how we clinically can at least um, have an idea how bad is the condition or how good is the condition so the if the jaundice is extending only up to the face head neck area then we say it is number one we give the number one then upper trunk number two three for lower trunk and then finally if it reaches up to palms and sole it is five which are five ten twelve fifteen um, and more than 15 respectively the bilirubin level however it can be absolutely misguiding or misleading if we rely upon our clinical judgment solely right because if the baby's skin complexion is dark you may underestimate the bilirubin clinically if the baby is very fair skin you can overestimate the bilirubin level so whenever there is suspicion whenever there is clinical appearance of jaundice better we go for the proper serum bilirubin testing even though i mentioned about the proportion of jaundice babies which can be more than 90 percent more than 95 percent but uh, thankfully most of these cases are actually physiological jaundice okay so it is kind of normal jaundice we can say why physiological jaundice develops there are there is a very high volume of rbc in the baby's blood and also these rbcs mostly contain hemoglobin f so they have decreased rbc lifespan there is decreased uh, ligandine or y protein in the liver so there is uh, not adequate transport of uh, albumin bound bilirubin to the hepatocytes newborn babies has decreased activity of udp glucuronide transferase enzyme as well and most of the newborn babies especially if they are uh, exclusively breastfed there is increased enterohepatic circulation which uh, basically brings back the uh, metabolized bilirubin into the circulation again so these are the few explanation why physiological jaundice um, uh, occurs typically the physiological jaundice um, starts appearing after 24 hours but it becomes clinically undetectable uh, by 10 to 14 days if jaundice appears before 24 hours or if jaundice extending or persisting beyond 14 days it is probably not physiological so we have to exclude other causes of this jaundice and physiological jaundice reaches the peak on fourth or fifth day in term and seventh day in preterm babies usually disappears without treatment most of these babies do not require even phototherapy so when to say is uh, pathological so any jaundice which is not meeting the criteria of physiological jaundice we have to say these are pathological jaundice what are those conditions if it is appearing within the first 24 hours of life after the first week of life or it is persisting more than two weeks total serum bilirubin rises by more than five milligram per dl per day which is again significant rise so significant rate of rise which may not be physiological total serum bilirubin level in any circumstances rising more than 18 milligram per dl it is very risky to say physiological jaundice 
uh, infant shows symptoms or signs of serious illness so jaundice can have lower threshold to give rise to complications and some of the most common pathologic causes uh, why or uh, when uh, patho jaundice could be pathological jaundice could be of extreme clinical significance immunology immune and non-immune hemolytic anemia hematoma resorption and sepsis and obviously hypothyroidism we have to address jaundice and at the same time the management of congenital hypothyroidism as well to prevent long-term neurological um, problems so there are a few red flags in the management of jaundice if you see jaundice is appearing within the first day of life in some cases in some authors they say if jaundice is appearing within 48 hours of life so it is basically between 24 to 48 hours total serum bilirubin level I, as i mentioned more than 18 milligram per dl if the rate of rise more than 5 milligram per dl per day and conjugated bilirubin if it is more than 20 mill uh, 20 percent of total serum bilirubin jaundice after two weeks of age and also if the baby have general systemic symptoms so these are the few red flag signs what are the consequences of hyperbilirubinemia well in most of the cases it can be absolutely harmless but in some other occasions it can be seriously harmful depending on its cause and the degree of elevation hyperbilirubinemia of any etiology is a concern once the level is high enough the threshold for concern varies by chronological age of the baby by degree of prematurity or gestational age at birth and also general condition of the baby what it actually uh, why we are so concerned about hyperbilirubinemia because this rise in unconjugated bilirubin level uh, it is easily uh, fat soluble this unconjugated uh, bilirubin can cross blood brain barrier and it has a special affinity to particular areas of the brain which are uh, basal ganglia and it destroys the basal ganglia which will uh, ultimately lead, leading to serious neurological consequences so uh, extreme neonatal hyperbilirubinemia has long been known to cause clinical syndrome carnic terus or chronic bilirubin encephalopathy this a uh, carnic terus has, has a tetrad of symptoms consisting of a movement disorder consisting of not only atherosclerosis or dystonia but it may include spasticity and hypotonia as well in addition it can be associated with auditory dysfunction oculomotor impairments and also mm -hmm. dental enamel hyperplasia of the deciduous state neurological findings correspond to the neuropathological lesions in these, these uh, different parts of uh, the brain basal ganglia especially globus pallidus subthalamic nucleus cerebellum and brainstem nuclei can also be involved auditory brainstem nuclei and perhaps the auditory nerve as well and brainstem oculomotor nuclei the chronic condition of carnic terus may be but not always preceded in the acute stage by acute bilirubin encephalopathy this acute neonatal condition is also due to hyperbilirubinemia and is characterized by lethargy abnormal behavior evolving to frank neonatal encephalopathy opisthotonus and seizures mri of brain shows uh, acute abnormalities in the globus pallidus and subthalamic nucleus in the recent time there is another terminology has been evolving which is called bilirubin induced neurologic dysfunction it is a constellation of neurologic sequelae following milder degrees of neonatal hyperbilirubinemia than are associated with carnic terus. so this is less completely defined syndrome but it is actually uh, suggested by uh, multiple authors in uh, different uh, renowned journals first in 1999 the bilirubin induced uh, neurologic dysfunction scoring algorithm was developed by Bhutani and his group and uh, they scored 
from uh, the, there are three components of this score scoring uh, each of this component has got zero to three so maximum score will be nine and minimum will be zero nine is the most serious condition and zero uh, is basically there is no encephalopathy you can see the scoring here mental status muscle tone cry pattern so each has got uh, four components starting from zero to three and then total score of maximum can be nine which is seven to nine which is advanced uh, encephalopathy four to six is moderate one to three mild in the management of uh, neonatal hyperbilirubinemia actually the early detection early diagnosis and monitoring proper monitoring uh, these are the key points the routine examination of all newborn babies within 24 hours of birth and the next 48 hours for possible jaundice which is very important in uh, the assessment of jaundice monitoring of infants who had delayed cord clamping at birth this is very important as we all know delayed cord clamping has a lot of advantages but one of the fewer or minor disadvantage is that the baby may develop significant jaundice and baby may require treatment for hyperbilirubinemia if jaundice is suspected examine the infant naked in a well lit room or preferably in natural daylight near a window guided by Kramer's chart visual signs of jaundice can lead to errors as i already mentioned in darkly uh, pigmented infants blanching of the gum could be a reliable marker in the babies who are dark skinned if jaundice is visible better you do not rely on your physical assessment only whether to or whether not to start phototherapy so better you go for total serum bilirubin or at least transcutaneous bilirubin measurement uh, nowadays this simple easy to use uh, equipment of transcutaneous bilirubin emitter is available everywhere so if the tcb values above 12 milligram per dl should be cross-checked with tsb measurement because sometimes there is disparity between tcb and tsb and follow-up of infants who are going home before 48 hours after delivery especially babies with established risk factors should be done within one to two days after discharge so when when we treat phototherapy of course the number one modality of treatment is phototherapy and we depend on the age specific actionable concentrations of tsb and uh, tsb and in some cases tcb so we refer to the age specific bilirubin nomogram to decide about uh, phototherapy or if the baby is going beyond the level of phototherapy whether the baby requires exchange transfusion or not so this is very well known scenario of any neonatal unit the babies are undergoing phototherapy this device uh, uh, used fluorescent bulbs uh, which was first described in 1958 and it has become the mainstay of treatment of neonatal jaundice currently how it works phototherapy helps uh, the light uh, absorbs um, absorption um, happen by bilirubin in the skin transforms the bilirubin into uh, photoisomers of bilirubin into structural isomers of bilirubin in addition bilirubin works on bilirubin to make some photooxidation to uh, make bilirubin into smaller fragments and ultimately these products of photo uh, phototherapy they are excreted through the uh, bile and urine so the efficacy of phototherapy depends on the irradiance, irradiance and spectrum of the light, the exposed body surface area and total serum bilirubin level. These all are very important. The wavelength of the phototherapy light has to be 430 to 490 nanometer, precisely 425 to 475. The irradiance is very important. It has to be 30 microwave per square meter per nanometer. So exposure of the body surface area, I want to say a few points. 
when we expose, we have to make sure the body of the neonate is completely exposed. Unless if it is a male child, you can just cover the external genitalia. And of course, we have to take care of the eye shield. We have to cover the eyes because there is a small risk of retinal damage and small risk of gonadal damage for the male babies. And uh, the source of uh, light, the phototherapy lights should be as close as the body of the baby. Uh, in the old days, we used to keep the phototherapy light at 50 centimeter from the baby. Then it came to 35 centimeter. But now it is recommended if it is not causing hyperthermia to the baby, you can put the phototherapy light at even 10 centimeter from the baby's skin. So the more is the exposure, the better it is the efficacy. The closer the phototherapy source to the body, better is the efficacy of the phototherapy light. So uh, in the recent time, LED phototherapies have become very popular and we have a common idea that LED phototherapy lights are actually more effective than the conventional phototherapy lights. However, in, uh, there are two meta-analyses I came across uh, where the, uh, the authors concluded that LEDs and non-LED lights are equally effective in reducing total serum bilirubin level. So centers where there is no LED level, uh, LED phototherapy is available, they should not feel bad that we are under treating our babies. However, LED phototherapy has got some other advantages. What are those? Light, the emission of spectrum is narrower in LED phototherapy. Here, they emit less unnecessary or potentially harmful wavelengths light. They produce less heat so that the distance from the device to the infant can be reduced and the irradiance will increase. And irradiance decreases very slowly over time. That means half-life of that light is very long. It provides an extended lifetime of the light source. So you may have to replace the lights less frequently than the conventional. And these lights are so uh, friendly that they do not cause significant transepidermal water loss because they emit less infrared radiation. There is another popular equipment in photo, for phototherapy has been in use for uh, quite a, a long time now, which is Billy Blanket. So uh, Billy Blanket is a portable phototherapy device for the treatment of hyperbilirubinemia. The name is a combination of bilirubin and Billy Blanket. There, there are other names as well for this, which is like home phototherapy system, bilirubin blanket or phototherapy blanket. The overhead phototherapy can be combined with phototherapy from below in the form of fiber optic blankets or billy blanket. And several studies have shown that such double phototherapy is more effective in reducing TSB than single phototherapy. This billy blanket device has got some parts. There is a box which is called illuminator box. And inside the box, there is illuminator which contains the custom halogen light bulb, which is the source of therapeutic light. There is fiber optic pad, which transmits the light from the light source to the baby. And there is a disposable cover or vest on which the baby is kept. And you can actually wrap the baby to ensure prevention of hypothermia to the baby. And actually the normal routine care also can be maintained. So there are several advantages of Billy Blanket. What are those? Infant can be held with no discontinuation of phototherapy. Billy Blanket can be used round the clock. It can be, the babies can be nursed in cot instead of incubator. Encourages infant maternal bonding, which is really very important. And no heat or electrical dangers to the baby. And there is almost like nil insensible water loss, blanket uh, more flexible and comfortable. So it is very, very comfortable to the baby. And as I said, there is no risk of, there's no necessity to discontinue the treatment uh, for any procedure also. But the most important disadvantage with Billy Blanket is 
it is not a very strong modality of treatment for phototherapy commonly asked questions should we change the position of the baby frequently in fact most of us we do that changing infant position every second to third hour is basically a routine practice in many neonatal units but interestingly it was not found to have any impact on the response of phototherapy so it's basically a institutional choice whether you should do this routinely or you should not another common question cycled versus continuous phototherapy sometimes we do the intermittent phototherapy we keep the baby under the light for say 45 minutes take the baby for 15 minutes out of the phototherapy unit do some nursing routine nursing and put the baby uh, uh, back to the phototherapy or you should not do you should not do that you should just continue the uh, phototherapy uh, without any uh, interruption so uh, like both are practiced in different places there are studies actually where they have found that both are equally effective there is no difference in terms of um, lowering the bilirubin level but of course if the john bilirubin level is significantly high it is reaching exchange level you are looking at intensive phototherapy you are trying to avoid um, exchange transmission which is an invasive procedure in that case probably it is advisable uh, to continuous phototherapy rather than uh, cycled or intermittent phototherapy so this is very well known chart we we follow which is devised by american academy of pediatrics there are quite a few charts actually for the babies who are 35 weeks or more who are less than 35 weeks um, and there is one for very low birth weight babies as well and apply similarly there are charts for exchange transmission as well so exchange transmission few points about exchange transmission um, exchange transmission is generally regarded as the last line of defense after phototherapy has failed uh, to uh, lower tsb to safe level in babies with significant neonatal hyperbilirubinemia the requirement of exchange transmission in developed countries has declined drastically over the uh, last decade or so because of uh, routine use of resus immunoglobulin profile axis and routine surveillance of the blood grouping during pregnancy iso immunization of rh negative uh, we, uh, in case of rh immunization of rh negative mother and also optimization of blue light phototherapy an exchange transmission involves removing aliquots of patient blood and replacing with donor blood in order to remove abnormal blood components and circulating toxins whilst ma maintaining adequate circulating blood volume a total serum bilirubin level at or above exchange transmission level should be considered as medical emergency and intensive phototherapy should be commenced immediately awaiting the procedure for exchange transmission what are the common indications of exchange transmission commonly the alloimmune hemolytic conditions of the newborn significant unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia with risk of chronic teres, severe anemia uh, due to any cause antibodies in maternal autoimmune disease sometimes uh, in a baby with significant uh, polycythemia we do exchange but that is different than the conventional exchange transmission we do partial exchange in that condition if the trend of serum bilirubin levels in response to treatment clinical uh, uh, clinical presentation of infant underlying conditions and previous treatment at referring hospital if applicable these are the points to be considered by the consultant neonatologist before deciding for exchange transmission um, typically we do double volume exchange as we all know the blood volume in a term infant is 80 to 90 ml per kg in a preterm infant it is about 800 ml per kg so we take double volume of blood and it replaces approximately 85 percent of blood volume single volume exchange is indicated in some conditions especially if the etiology is not due to hemolytic disease of the newborn so what are the criteria of the blood it must have a hematocrit of 0.5 to 0.6 and blood should be as fresh as possible 
it uh, like at least less than five days old it has to be irradiated blood and should be cmv negative there are a lot of complications uh, related to exchange transmission which commonly common is common ones are uh, related to catheter like air embolism thrombosis hemorrhage hemodynam uh, hemodynamic imbalance uh, and potential complications related to exchange transmission are arrhythmias bradycardia neutropenia feed intolerance necrotizing enterocolitis has been reported by some authors that it is associated with exchange transmission however uh, reported incidence of nec following et uh, exchange transmission was 0.9 uh, There is another uh, review article I came across where they uh, they um, said that they 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 mentioned that uh, the relationship of exchange transmission and necrotizing enterocolitis is either rare or there is no association. There are I am running short of time, so I have to conclude uh, quickly. Adjunct therapy. Um, so there are some adjunct therapy has been in practice actually in the management of neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. Uh, these are intravenous immunoglobulin, which reduces bilirubin concentration in babies with precious hemolytic disease and other hemolytic conditions. And uh, the dose is one gram per kg given intravenously over two hours. Phenobarbiton, it can improve bile flow, but actually it is not recommended nowadays in the treatment of hyperbilirubinemia. There is an one exception though, if the, if the diagnosis is uh, Krigler-Najjar syndrome, where uh, Krigler-Najjar syndrome type two, where there is inadequate production of hepat uh, uh, uridine um, gluconyl transferase, uh, in that case, phenobarbiton is indicated. Metalloporphyrin has been in discussion for quite long time, but it, it was never established as a treatment modality of uh, hyperbilirubinemia. I just have seen this article published in uh, by a group from Egypt uh, where they claimed that vitamin D and melatonin along with phototherapy can be uh, an important adjunct therapy in reducing hyperbilirubinemia. This is quite interesting. So, of course, uh, like any other condition, prevention is better than cure. How can we prevent? Uh, in many cases, actually, uh, it is preventable to uh, have the significant level of bilirubin, especially if we educate uh, the parents, uh, uh, the existing and expectant parent. Promotion and support for successful breastfeeding, screening of uh, expectant mothers for risk of blood group incompatibilities, especially RH incompatibility. And if the mother is of O group, in that case, we have to be careful that the baby can have significant uh, um, hyperbilirubinemia. And if the baby is having extensive bruise, cephalohematoma, and fractures, and babies at risk of concealed hematomas, uh, especially the babies who had difficult deliveries, we have to be careful while assessing the baby clinically. How do we plan discharge? So jaundice in the first 24 hours of life should be investigated as priority. Before discharge, of course, we have to make sure that there is no pathological cause of jaundice. Conjugated hyperbilirubinemia should be investigated thoroughly and assess all babies for risk of developing severe hyperbilirubinemia at hospital discharge, particularly if discharge occurs before 72 hours of life as these babies are likely to still have a rising serum bilirubin level. So this is how we tentatively follow the discharge uh, follow-up plan. If the babies are discharged 24 hours, baby should be seen again at 20, 72 hours and likewise like the gap should be about 48 hours from this church and during the follow-up we must see if there is presence absence of severity of jaundice baby's weight and percentage of change from the birth weight adequacy of intake voiding and stooling pattern clinical judgment to determine the need for total serum bilirubin level recommended if there is history of phototherapy so in most of the cases, we repeat serum bilirubin if there is history of phototherapy. That's basically about my presentation. I would like to conclude with some take home messages. Consider the risk factors, particularly prematurity and hemolysis. Follow up is very important. Follow up is the key, basically. 
consider how well baby is feeding parents ability to return reliability of course is very important whether they are really coming back or not the higher the number of risk factors the lower the level at which we need to intervene look for conjugated hyperbilirubinemia this is almost always pathological sometimes you will be surprised we can't always prevent hyperbilirubinemia but we should always prevent carnicterus that's all about my presentation thank you for patient hearing thanks again thank okay um